But that is the problem out there on the road, because everyone wants to be in charge. And you can't. One man, one fucking job. Yeah? And you can't all be in charge, and that is why it's wrong out on the road at the moment. If you want me to tell you a little bit of thing, out on the road at the moment, it's because you all want to be in charge. And that's why it's all going wrong. You can't. Sorry, that's where you're fucking up. Hi guys, welcome back to KRM TV. Today I'm delighted to be invited to a very special location to meet an even more special guest. Today we're at Camelot Castle, the home of the Yellow Page of the Underworld, Dodgy Dave Courtney. So thank you for inviting us here today, Dave. And thank you for taking the time to talk to you. It's been with us. My pleasure, sir. Enjoy. Enjoy we we certainly hour. will, and the viewers <laughs> certainly will even more. So um, very cool. much appreciated. So I don't even know, we're a specialist in crime channel. Yeah. So we want to go back to the start, if possible. I don't know if you know, I'm a specialist in crime. Well, this is why we're here, you know. So this <laughs> yeah. is the prime location for us. This is the start, you know. You so uh, we want to know, but how did you get into crime? Was it as a kid, or was it when the door firm started? And then you got <coughs> into um, I don't actually think you get into crime. I think you're actually born uh, naughty. Yeah. Mm. You yeah, know, you can... Along the way, you can actually start blaming things like the computer games or the uh, videos on the rap record or, you know, let's stop milk at school, no green areas to play on, and so I became a criminal. Yeah, that's not actually right, mate. Mm. You're born naughty. You're born fucking naughty, yeah? It's in you. You can't help it. Probably, unfortunately, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, well, no, yeah, it's I know, but like, fuck, you can't help it. No, so yeah. you were a troublesome kid when it's school? Oh, no, or? no, no, I don't. Oh, I can't actually blame anything on my childhood. I had a beautiful parent, um, parent relationship with my parents. I weren't poor, but I was an I was an entertainer. Yeah. yeah. So at school, you. Th I was an entertainer. I was I was a court jester mm. all my life. Mm. Yeah, and that and that um, <clears throat> made me attractive to the older boys. Mm. As being a court jester, it made me a little bit more. Adventurous and I do it, I do it, yeah, fuck it, I do it, I do it, mm. yeah. And I'm afraid, as much as this may sound, um, trying to big myself up, which I'm not, there is such thing as natural leader material and a natural soldier. Not that either one is more important than the other, because they're not, yeah. The soldier needs a leader, and the leader needs, yeah, you know, it all goes wrong when uh, I'm afraid. Uh, look, look, but when, when I'm asked, when I'm asked of the youth for today, Dave, and what can you do about the problem and all that shit and all that, yeah. uh, the truth is this, everyone has forgot the importance of the fucking pecking order, mm. yeah, there is a private, there is a sergeant, there is a corporal, there is a major, there is a sergeant major, right, and you've got to run with that, what the world runs with that, unless you are foolish enough and let, and let the world like we are at the moment, yeah, we let the world like we are at the moment mm. take all them choices away from us and, and, and make us like a police state, yeah. But that is the problem out there on the road because everyone wants to be in charge. And you can't. One man, one fucking job, yeah. And you, you can't all be in charge and that is what is wrong out on the road at the moment. If you want me to tell you a little bit of thing, out on the road at the moment it's because you all want to be in charge and that's why it's all going wrong. You can't. Sorry, that's where you're fucking up. So we're getting to the sort of the current state bit of what's sort of the problems going Sorry, on. Sorry, I veered off there. No, that's perfect. I, I want you to go, no, this is, I I want you to go on as yeah. much as you can in different bits. But um, So talk to me, what came yeah. first for you? Were you? Did you get on the doors and then you got into, started getting into sort of serious well, crime? No, 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 yeah, it's a bit like ADHD. Yes. Yeah, you it's, it's an illness up until you're 16. Yeah. And on that one day that becomes your 16th birthday, that illness becomes prisonable the next day. Yeah. In ADHD, you got ADHD till you're 18, and then after 18, you're not allowed to run around, smash windows, and set like that. You go to prison for it. So you better fucking mend it before 18. Hundred. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's. That's naughty as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's in you as that. You don't even you don't even know you're doing it. So by the time I was 16, I was naughty. Yeah, I was on it. I was driving stolen cars, stolen motorbikes, in and out of warehouses, in and out of shops. I had all the big kids. Didn't need to have a punch up because that was all on my side, you know. And there is such thing as natural leader material. And I became in charge at a very early age of people that, 
um, although physically far, far superior than me, mentally they needed a man to be in charge. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I slipped into that role and it turned into the same when I was in the criminal world, it's turned into the same when I was in the dormant world, I was the one in charge. Everyone, everyone that I employed could kick fuck out of Dave Courtney. Right, look at them, you know. <coughs> everyone that I employed could kick fuck out of Dave Courtney, you know what I mean? Look at them, they're, they're monsters, but I was in charge, yeah? And that was just before, that was well before the raving scene came in. And then it, as soon as the raving team started, everyone wanted 50 doormen. Well, you had three and 60 doormen and 10, you know, and, and, it, and it propelled me into a financial um, position of power and a physical position of power. Of course. Yeah, so then, and crime came with that. I was almost like a, a, a job centre for criminals because once you become a doorman, if you didn't know where to get someone beat up, how to get your neighbour out, how to get the money back for that car to give, just give you a moody check. Even if you didn't know one, you did know the doorman down the club and he knew someone. All right? And three days a week or three nights a week they were working for me. The other five days a week they were unemployed, so I gave them, go and get the squatters out. I became a job centre mm. for naughty people. I didn't mean it to be that. Yeah, hence the yellow pages for the underworld. All I am is a scary fucking phone book, mate. Yeah, me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm this, you know. Of course. So but if you let me get to my phone book. Yeah, no, dangerous, <laughs> a problem for anyone. So some yeah, one thing you touched on there, the, the legal raves, um, what sort of was the late 80s and the 90s? So talk to yeah, us the late bit. 80s, yeah. Talk yeah, to yeah. us about I, a little I, bit I about was, that. I, was, I got into the, I oh. went over to um, New York with uh, Richard Branson and he came back and opened up Heaven yep. and I came back and opened up a load of railway arches. And, you know, the, the reason I've done it weren't the drugs. I, I promise, I'll tell you the reason I've done it. I come from an era where men went to a pub and bought drink. Mm. Uh, I, you couldn't even buy a bottle of water in a pub. Mm -hmm. If you went up to a fucking bar when I was a young man and went, two Ribenas, a lemonade, um, th three bottles of water and an orange juice, please, he'd punch you in the face. Uh, I went out to America and saw them at these raves where they were buying bottles of water that you fucking take out the tap. Yeah. Buying bottles of water two at a time for a five each, tipping one over their head yeah, for a fiver, goggling another little bit and then tipping the rest over the head and buying more water for a tenner. Of that is what fucked my life. Yeah. That fucked my whole life. I was like, I couldn't get my head round it. Fuck the pill that made them sweat the dance to as he is and fold out. There they were queuing up, fucking five deep, to buy something that is in the tap by the sink, free, free, and they're buying it for a fiver and then chipping it over their head. I thought, fucking hell, I'm going to go home and be a multi millionaire. I'm going to go and buy Europe. Yeah, what happened? You know what happened? Yeah, DJ, look, you're in my castle, man. Nice. This nice. is all down at the tap. What I've done is I'll come home and I bought. Nearly three quarters of a ton of empty EVM bottles. It got, got delivered to me on a on on on, on pallet. Oh, I'm really sorry to all them people that oh, come to the oh, I'm going to fess up. I am genuinely very very sorry to all you people that came to the arches with me all them years ago when I had a little fringe and all that right. That bought bottles of water. This is what I done. They come to you empty, but when you buy a bottle of water at a nightclub, they actually give you it out the fridge, take the top off. And give you it, because you don't want chops on the floor when you're all out there doing your fucking dancing thing, you know what I mean? Whoa, and all that, yeah? You don't get the top of a bottle on the floor when you're doing a backflip, you know what I mean? And so I was just filling them all up with the water out of the tap. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I thought it was a bank robber. I thought I might as well put a mask on. I was like, filling it up, I'm going, Fiver. Fiver. Uh, fucking fridges loads of it. But, and as I gave it to them, I undone it and gave them, and they went, thanks, Dave. Uh, and I was like, fuck, man. So I bought a castle. Absolutely brilliant. Right, Rolls Royce. Absolutely. You don't need to be involved in the drugs they're bringing in when you're selling the water and making that sort of profit oh. margin. better than the drugs, Stop. isn't it? Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm actually having a premature ejaculation. Oh, that's one fantastic. I'm about this. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so how many court cases have you won? 23, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 23, which is absolutely incredible. Better than most lawyers have won, you know. Stop it. So, again, I what's, what's the secret to your success? A good lawyer? <laughs> the is secret your of my success. Is your... No, no, no. I'll tell you the secret of my success. 
I'm afraid this is going to be so unromantic. Yeah. All right. The secret of my success was I'd done all my um, getting not guilty before there was Facebook. Mm. Because the law is, if there's, an element, if there's an element of doubt, the law, if there's an element of doubt, you have to go not guilty. Because we can be guilty of letting a guilty man get away, but we can't be guilty of putting an innocent man in prison. And all you need is witnesses. And if I bring up 20 witnesses to say, I was at Dave's house last night, me, myself, and I'm a, I'm a fireman, I'm a sergeant major, I'm a um, police cadet, I'm a... You know, if you get 20 people to go, he was at me at my house last night, that's the element of doubt. Mm. So you could get away with an awful lot if you had the people with another arsehole to stand up and go, I swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, come back to the truth, so help me God, and lie. You could get away with murder. But now, there's Facebook. And if your witness is, you put him as a witness, they go, of course he's a witness, he's your brother-in-law, has all his pictures all over Facebook, you've known him for years. And that witness there, she's known you for years. And all the other four witnesses, they've all known you for years. So I can't do that no more. Because they just go, look, all these witnesses, the best car accident that you had in Oxford, all are on your Facebook. So you're fucked. That's how I got to have it. Yeah, so it's impossible to be as deep as what you may have been. And yeah, yeah, there's, be there's other things today. you can do like this, you know. right? If, if it's enough evidence to put you in prison, mm. like your phone was used two metres away from the thing, oh. or your car was seen at this thing here three kilometres away from the thing, right? If there's enough proof to put you in prison, you can be clever, and while you're doing your crime, you send him off to Oxford to use your phone, and you send him down to fucking Oxford to drive your car and get a parking ticket. And when you go, I was at Oxford, if you can go, but look, right? if there's enough evidence to get you put in prison normally, it should be enough evidence to cool. not. Yeah, there's a little tip for you, a little money saving tip for McDonald's. Oh no, you're loving this, sir. Right, Sarge? So that's a different way of looking at it. So you can use the technology, you can it. use technology to your advantage, a smart right, 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 right. So it sounds right. like you might still be involved, Dave. Don't tell us no, it's not true. No, me, stop it. I'm a silly fat old man from South London. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, talk to you. There's a fantastic story about the, when you went to the court case dressed as a jester and tell us about what happened on the day of the... Well, no, no, no. I can't tell you. I can, I can, I can lead up to the day. Yeah. Oh, you see. Yeah. But the bottom line is this. If you're a professional criminal, you should have, and if you sh if you could have, you should grab it with both hands, a bent copper. Yeah? Everyone, if, you know, if you're a professional villain, you should have a bent copper, someone that tells you when you're being watched, what house the camera's in, what the registration numbers are who's following you, I can open just a bag and then to get done for contaminated evidence, a court case can't go on, all that. You get all that, right? Yeah. I had one, and after 20 years, I got caught with one, and when he got caught, and he got, he was following him, not me, and when they filmed him, and he got caught talking to Courtney, when they nicked him and went, you're a Ben Copper, you're on Courtney's books. Yeah, he's had you for 25 years, 30 years. You know, his defence was, no, I'm paying him. Well, you know, well, had that been believed, I'd have been shot. That was, that was 20 odd years ago, by the way, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, right, right, but had that been believed, I'd have been shot. And all the proof was, I actually taped him when we had our meeting, only because I'm cleverer. Sorry. Only because I'm cleverer. I actually taped him, right? Yeah. And went up there and I had a little chat. He asked me to do something. I'd done that with him. Taped it. And we all got caught. He got caught. And his defence was, I was actually giving him information. When it was the other way around. Well, I proved it by giving him the tape. Yeah. But for a little eight months, there was a little time while I was going to the alcohol, am I telling him or is he telling me? And because I was making it like I might be a... Uh, an informant, yeah. You know, I, I felt so humiliated and, and hurt and angry about it. So I went, look, if you put me within arm's reach of that man, I'm going to punch him in the fucking head. You know what I mean? I, I can only get not guilty. I'll give you a tape of what he said. You're only making me go to court so you can call me a grass for eight months. So that when it gets to the day of the court started, which is exactly what happened, the day the court started, he changed his plea to guilty. Uh, Right? But while he was going not guilty, they could go, caught his grass, caught his grass, caught his grass, caught his grass. And at the time they'd done that, I was actually running for Lord Mayor of London. Yeah, I was doing, I, I, I had a regular column in, in, in a monthly magazine. It was all 
Dave Dave Dave, the number one bestseller. I was doing my ninth book. Yeah, I'm running for mayor. I've just got caught with a bent copper. I'm going to get not guilty. The copper's going to go to prison. Courtney's going to write another book about the bent coppers. Yeah, and then all of a sudden I got mysteriously run over. Right, I got mysteriously run over by a, a car by a car at one in the morning on the M4. Apparently they've lost all of the police footage for that accident. Um, they said that there was a police car, an unmarked police car, following me at the time that took 14 witness statements. But I'm afraid, because I was in a coma for seven weeks, if Mr. Courtney doesn't understand an office environment, I'm afraid things get lost. That's why I had to swallow, yeah? And the there was no fucking video footage of the A2, the road that goes from Dover to London. They didn't have it that day, right? They, 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 they pinged me. Yeah? So I was in hospital for nine months. I did actually, when I got not guilty for the crime, um, take the police to court for attempted murder, saying that about me. And that's when they run me over. Mm. So I have got all the all the uh, paraphernalia approved. I took the police to court for saying it. No, that's attempted murder. What if, if what you were saying about me, which has now been proved in the old Bailey, is not true, if what you've been saying about me is not true, that could have got me shot. So that's fucking attempted murder, mate. Yeah? Yeah. Hear me, you know. And then looking, obviously, we're a few years down the line from that now, looking at your track record, 23 court cases that you've got the not guilty of. I'm my, sure my God, if, you, if, if you were helping their side, you'd have thought they'd treat you a little bit better than that one, trying to put you in jail every five minutes, you know? Listen, they have fucked me, right? They have nicked me on the day I was going on holiday, so I can't go on holiday. They have, I've been on a driving ban for 13 years. Yeah. Every single year I send off my medical to go and get my licence back, they go, no, you've got alcohol in your blood. You go, and I can't go, I haven't drunk for nine months. I haven't took a drug. I haven't. Because who, who do you know that goes, no? It's just a thing on the thing that says, no, you don't know it was. You just get 13 years they've not given one other. I get a yearly passport. Oh, yearly. I have to pay £89 a year for my one year passport. So for that year, the last six months, I can't use because there's some places you can't go if I've only got six months left. What? Yeah. That's Crazy, I've never heard right, of right, like right. that. And you pay fucking dearly for getting away with your crime, right? You might have got a not guilty, yep. but only in, and only on, on the day in their head, they've got you. 29 not guilty, do you think they're going, <laughs> Dave got you, or do you think they're going to hold that? Yeah, yeah? Well, If West Ham beat fucking Charlton 29 times in a row, do you think Charlton are ever going to like you? It sounds like they're certainly holding a grudge with you. Well, listen, I'm paying fucking dearly now, sir, yeah. for my getting away with it then. Because they've just clamped down red car, red red uh, tape. Red tape, right? Yeah, put, doing everything. You know what I mean? They've stopped me owning a pub, doing a show in a pub. They go to the owner, don't have Courtney here and his cronies, or you won't have a license for a fucking telly, mate. Now fuck him off. And they go, Dave will cancel it. And they've stopped me going on the telly. They've made it now a, a legal law. You can't glamorise crime. So Virgin can publish my book. But they can't put a poster up going, Dave's got a new book out because the poster's glamorising crime. So, right? I can't go to the telly no more, I can't do the radio. Every journalist, for a photographer and a journalist, this house spews it. Look at me, bleh, I'll give you a fucking story. That's and for that's... a photographer, look at the house. But they're not allowed to take pictures because you can't glamorise crime. That's outrageous, right? but luckily at the moment it's transitioned, doesn't it, to obviously the, the online is the main sort of media these yeah, days. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck, Luckily for you, as you Robin. know what buttons to push. Well, but for a silly old fucker Robin. like me, yeah, I don't understand all that. So, And I know this is Indeed. Um, the way forward. Absolutely. And I'm trying. Good. I'm trying. Good. Well, much appreciate. So um, there's um, impossible to go not talk about how you came to prominence as such with the Craze funeral. Back no, listen, listen, listen. Talk to me I, how, I, about I, how you got that gig. Obviously, we know you had a big door firm, but how would yeah, you get that position? I, I, I'm the biggest door firm. Yeah, the, the biggest door firm in London. There was no one for me to ever fight with because there weren't anyone else to fight with. It was on my side, right? And, um, but that was a different era before CCTV cameras and you could get away with fucking murder, but I'm the biggest. And I got in touch with them because um, I was seeing a lady at the time who had an identical twin, a black lady who I ended up marrying and children with, Jennifer. And so they made a, a song called They Took the Rap. And they were rappers and they'd done it a set. A set of twins done a song about a set of twins. They took the rap. Uh, they wanted to see me anyway. They'd asked to actually see me about a year before because I was doing all the doors up there and they wanted some help with some things. So because of that, I went down to see Ronnie in Broadmoor. We became good friends and then went to meet Reggie. 
we became even better friends because it was closer and blah, blah, blah. So I was more or less down there once a week for 10 years or 15 years. You know, I got to know the local newspaper man. He used to wait for me when I came out of Maidstone. Um, uh, Mr. Edmondson. And he used to wait for me when I came out of Maidstone. He was writing for the Maidstone Gazette or something, you know, whatever. And he used to write all the stories about what, what, what the craze said said to me and then and then um ronnie died there was a threat to the actual funeral parlor about not everyone's a ronnie fan we're going to come down and burn it down while he's in there they got in touch with reg reg got in touch with me and said would i sleep in the funeral parlor for a couple of weeks i went yeah cool man you know so i'm in there and trying to find a couple of mates to sleep in a funeral parlor with you with ronnie cray as one of the dead boys that's hard work right? <laughs> trying to find someone to come and help you fight if I wanted to go and shoot him, they'd queue up at my door, drive me there. But to sleep in the dead body shop was like, wow. <laughs> but I did. And it was during that week that they realised the velocity of what was actually going to occur with the crazy funeral and the worldwide media attention it was going to bring. And then they went, look, we need security for this. They didn't know it straight away. It's the first funeral that anyone's ever needed. 150, 200 of England's hardest men to do a fucking security, right? Hear me. I, and they're not ever going to allow it to happen again because that was a little show of force on worldwide TV and the TV ain't going to fucking give you or me that no more. Right? You ain't never going to get that. You know what I mean? This is absolutely awesome, isn't it? Stop it. So talk to me about... Hold the... it. I've just come. <laughs> get some tissues. <laughs> yes. It was awesome. What were the twins like? Then? Um... Those crackers is what they made out to be? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were. Up. Listen, Ronnie Cray, who was the head of the firm, was already diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. And he's the one in charge. Mm. So it can only go downhill, can't he? Mm. You know what I mean? In reality, it can only go downhill. Yeah, he's as nutty as you want. And, and, um, Reggie was just, you know, like twins, you get a strong one and a, and a not weaker, just, you get a strong, you get a stronger one. And they're not a stronger one, you understand what I mean? Um, and Ronnie was a stronger one. Mm. Yeah, Ronnie was gay. I mean, if you say I'm gay, I'm going to take the piss out of my shoe in the forehead. Reggie was gay, married someone, didn't shag her, tried to hide it, didn't shag her for a fucking year, so she killed herself. All right? End of dot com, that's the bottom line of it. You can put a bit of a romance around it if you want. They weren't the hardest people in the fucking world. Yeah, they wouldn't run today. Yeah, they wouldn't run today. There was 15,000 people in Bethnal Green when they were doing it, and everyone spoke and understood English. Mm. There's 250,000 people in Bethnal Green today, and half of them couldn't say the word crap with. Right? So it wouldn't matter. Yeah, no Romanian firm, no Albanian firm, no Indian firm, no Chinese firm, no Jamaican firm, no South London firm are going to listen to two little cocksuckers who own a snooker all over in East London. It ain't going to work today. But it was romantic then, you know what I mean? So all hell to me. If it weren't for them, people that was on the wrong side of the law couldn't make a living out of their criminal past. And for a little 10 year stretch, we all could. But it's now stopped. Mm. Right? Hear me. They have cut that juggler van. No, mm. one, no one there can. But for a little while, they made it possible for me to sell Dave Courtney. And in reality, genuine naughty people ain't in the corner talking about devil. We're all, we're all quite normal and funny, yeah? So being, being able to give the same crack of the whip as everyone else in a film game or a music game or a chat show game, I'm as good as any, if not better than most. Right? But they don't fucking do that because you're not, all them times I've asked me to be on Big Brother and the jungle thing, all them times I've asked me and then there's someone at the top went, well, you can't put Courtney in there because if they don't get him a meal, he might lose it and attack someone. I was like, really? It's not stop. I'll eat, I'll eat a kangaroo bollock. I'll do, I'll do the thing. So when the kids or some of the young people are looking at you and thinking, this guy's living the dream, he was involved in crime, this is what I want to be. So if any sort of 16, 17, 18 year olds thinking, right, this, I'm going to get into it. Now, young English boys think they're a little bit naughty. What chances have they got of being successful in the life of crime today, Dave? None whatsoever. Huh? None. You are chasing a real silly dream like there is no more cowboys, knights in shining armour, pirates or gangsters. You have got no no chance in the world of trying to p 
pit your wits against a Sherlock Holmes policeman no more. You are trying to beat technology. They are taking pictures of you from the fucking moon. Your phone, your car, your cameras. You can't do it. So don't do it. And if you're chasing that little thing of whatever you see in a film, don't. Because it, it is no more. There is no more gangsters, right? Drugs is the only way out for you. And I understand why you do it. I can understand why you do it, but please believe me. That is all coming to an end somewhere down the line, right? You're all going to get proper fuck with that. Right? I'm really sorry. So you're saying, um, obviously, the British gangs are sort of a dying breed, especially in the modern day today. And then what about the Cockney, the London Cockney? Is that a dying breed? Is that a... Becoming what do you breed? think? Go over there where they're supposed to be cockneys and find an English boat. Yeah, I'm just asking. That's, that's yeah, I'm just telling you. So the cockney will go. Yeah. there will be a lovely word like pirate. Well, it's pretty much gone now. It it's like gone. Yeah, 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 Everyone's moved yeah, out. Yeah. No one wants to be these. But it's a them. lovely word. It's romantic. I like, like, I like, I like romantic. As soon as it's going to be an extinct. Yeah, I, word, I, I am one of them extinct old blokes that have done their bit. Yeah, yeah. I ain't scared, am I? Yep. You know what I mean? I'm one of them old blokes. And I'm like trying to tell you I'm still at it because I wouldn't live in that fucking world where they're doing each other how they are so treacherous and devious and cunning. And That's not my thing. I'd be, I'd be so lost at it. I'd get shot in a day. Mm. So I can't. I've had to visually and publicly step out of it. That's, what, that's, that's why I wrote my book. Once I saw... Once I saw the influx of real naughty people. I don't want to compete with that because it, all right, I'll write my book, stop the ride, I want to get off. Yeah. Yeah? So that's right, it's not what you write in the book, it's what you fucking want to call it is important. Whatever you want to call it, you know, oh man, no, the firm, the governor, the best fighter in England, the chase his dog. You've got to live up to that. Stop the ride, I want to get off, yeah? The answer is in the question there. Yeah. I've just told you. Right. Yeah, absolutely fantastic book for any of the audience who haven't read it. Please go and uh, get a copy of it. Is it I'm sure it's on Amazon and the Kindle? Yeah, I'm sure it is. It's ev for everywhere. the audience that watched Dave Courtney, most of you can't read, so it doesn't matter. There's pictures. And my next book is a colouring book, so you'll be all right. Well, so, so you say the reasons for you getting into, obviously, the writing the books and stuff like this, obviously the influx of the people, I'm sure, because the pressure, the pressure, from the police, the pressure from the police at the same time, you're obviously so much under the spotlight. And so... Talk to me about how, how you wrote the first bit. Did you have help with it? And obviously, yeah, yeah, I, I, I had help with it. I was working. I was working at um, a very popular magazine at the time called the Front Magazine. Mm. And I was there for two years. I became their crime correspondent and all that. But it's it fantastic. I've wrote my whole life story. If anyone wants to go and check on, read every Front Magazine that's ever been done. In them stories, I wrote my story. Mm. Yeah, it's my column. So mm. I, I wrote about my life and. Um, I, I enjoyed that, yeah. But I'm, I, I've, got to, I've got to tell you about that crime thing. I am now paying more dearly now for what I've done then than I ever done then. Then, if you got caught, you've done a bit of bird for it and all that. But now, I'm having them stop caught you doing this, stop caught you doing that. They stop my babysitters coming here. They, you know, tell my kids and mm. won't give up. Yeah, yeah, I'm now paying for it more dearly now than I ever did before. So you don't just get away with it on a day. You pay for that down the line. So yeah, that's yeah. that's what sort of leads into sort of the from the books to the movie business. We know you've made loads of films, and so why haven't you yeah. managed to get into one of these sort of mainstream? Well, because sort of they, they're going. They, they've changed the law. It's a real law they've changed. I think they changed it about four years ago. It's a genuine law. You cannot glamorise crime. Vinnie Jones can play me. He's a footballer. Yeah, the naughtiest thing he ever done was Greg Gaz's nuts. You know what I mean? Yeah, he can yeah. play Dave. I can't play Dave because I'm genuinely uh, whatever they thought I portrayed me as. You know yeah. what I mean? And please believe me, I have to still ring my mum and go, Mum, something's come out of the paper. I'm really sorry. You know, I, I don't eat babies. I haven't... The shit, the shit that I read, the things I read about me, you know what I mean? I'm like, fuck, well, I can't stop it. I'm not, no good me going, I ain't really that horrible, <laughs> right? It's not worth me doing it because I know that 36 million people have read it. Well, fuck me, do you know Courtney eats babies? You know what I mean? Or whatever, you know? Yeah, it's mental. So mental. what about, because obviously weren't you um, doing the legal raids back in the day with Terry Stone? And I, was, I was doing that with Terry Stone, yeah. I was, I was doing that with Terry Stone. Listen, although he don't know it, I'm still a good friend of Terry Stone. 
But he, he's ended up in the same position as the other ones where they went to him. Um, you know, if you still have it with Dave Courtney, I can't help you get on. And I, and I helped him out in his earlier days in the rave scene, as, as many of his friends can tell you. I'm not, yeah, I helped him out of his magazines, I helped him out, I pro propelled his profile, put him as a little star of my film. And then it, from the film, he opened his own film thing. And I genuinely thought that he was going to use me and all the boys again. I did think that. But someone's had a little word of him and went, if you still have it with Dave Courtney, we, we're going to stop you getting on. And he saw the trouble I had getting my film out. He saw the money I spent, the time, effort, work, learning experience. He saw all that. He was first hand. He helped me do it, you know, cans. And then saw it all get banned from anyone seeing it, weren't allowed to put it out in blocker. He saw all that, so he he um, had to physically be seen to do that. You know, hold his hand. I'm not a friend of Dave Courtney's, and me and my lady loved him a lot, and his mum and dad. And you know, but I haven't, I haven't seen or spoke to him for years and years and years. He's now cracking on with all these films. I'm not in any of them. He still uses all my mates. Mm. And good luck to him. Yeah. Yeah. There ain't nothing. There ain't nothing. I can hate him for. I, I'm not. I'm not jealous of it. I'm. I'm chuffed to fuck for him. But like, well, man. Yeah, you shouldn't talk to that. <laughs> I mean, so talk to me about. Chill. Love you. So talk to me about yeah. what you're up to today, presently, Dave. Any upcoming books or movies? Well, at or the moment, it's gone a bit dead. The same as everyone else says, uh, because of this. Um, yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, so it's all gone a bit dead for me. But and I, 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 I most probably wasted my time during that COVID era period and didn't do as many books as I should have done. I've got two books on the way. I've got an autobiography and I've got one of newspaper cuttings. It's just going to be a newspaper cutting on one side and then my story of what the truth was and the next 10 pages. So I've got one of them coming. I'm doing that at the moment. Um, I dare say it just um, slowly bounced back into life. But at the moment, it's a bit quiet for me, to be perfectly honest. I haven't got an awful lot planned. I'd be lying if I did. If you give me 10 minutes, I can make up a really good lie. Perfect. <laughs> and so, I'm just planning world domination, right? That's what I'm doing. And first thing, we're starting with Plumstead. So, indeed, we look like you conquered Plumstead for sure. But uh, maybe you could take over London again and kick all these sure. Eastern Europeans. Oh, well, I don't doubt that very much, but like, yeah. So um, I want to throw a few names at you if possible. Like, I've heard you mention yeah. before Joey Paul Senior. You've mentioned him being your mentor for people. Joe, 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 Joe Paul Senior, for me personally, was my mentor. I cannot give you a higher acclaim for a man than Mr. Paul Senior. Yeah, I can't give you a higher acclaim. I can, I can honestly say, more than anyone else in the world, I based Dave Courtney on the morals, ethics, and runnings of that man. I, I, I built this on that. So I can't give you a bigger there for Joe Paul Senior. Says right? it all. And so, how about Howard Marks? I know you became friends with him. And me and Howard like, Marks have been really people good People don't friends. know who is Howard Marks. Howard Marks was the biggest marijuana smuggler England's ever had. He got nicked with 56 ton, and, it, and, when, he, and when he got arrested, he went, I had no Rizla. I sacrificed my life to, uh, to legalise marijuana right now. You know, yeah. I don't give a fuck. Uh, but that's what I should try to do as hard as I possibly can. And if it requires me to smoke dope in police stations and do anything, I'll do it. How funny is it? He's, he's he got me into doing the um, the stand-ups that I do. You know, I've been all around the world of Alex. We've done Howard. We've done shows together in Channel Reef and you know, all over the years. A very very good friend of mine. A lovely, beautiful, funny man. And and gave and, and give and gave me such fantastic facts in where. How about this? Can I just tell you a little fact? Please. I'll hold it. Can I tell them? Please. How about this? If you are a drug dealer, sir, or man. Your biggest enemy is a police dog, because they are just, and they fuck up, yeah. They find everything. I've had some come in here, I didn't even know I had anything, and they sniffed out a bit of, in my turn up of my trousers, in a waistcoat that had been fucking dry cleaned ten times beyond the settee. When they squeezed it together, I had fucking half ounce down this fucking dog. But if you want to fuck that dog, it's all you got to do. If you go to, I know it sounds bizarre, but you got to run it for your head properly. Lion's shit. It's, they come in something called nobble, like that. Yeah? You can go to a million zoos, any zoo, they have tons of it every day, they throw it away. Get one bit of lion shit and just sprinkle it on your doormat. 
you don't see it, it all sinks in with the rain, you don't see it, no one can spend it. But a police dog whose nose is trained, before he comes in your house that day, will go, 18 stone cat. Fuck! For fuck it! Smell it again, it's eating beef. I ain't going in there to look for a bit of puff. And that dog is fucked before he gets in your house. He's fucked. I'm telling you, there's a fact. That was Howard Mark. He'd throw them at you all day long. And it's the God's honest truth. Right? If that dog went... Uh, 18 stone cat. He would, he would do that, wouldn't it? He wouldn't go in, would it? He'd like, fuck that. He don't want to look beyond the skirting board. He's looking for the cat. <laughs> That's how you fuck him. But that was Howard Mark. That was Howard Mark. All day, every day, 24 hours a day, he'd come out with things like that. And would add you, and I like a talk, I, I'm a talker. But he would have me like... <laughs> but the guy was literally a genius as well. Oh, so it's so unusual uh, for someone like that uh, to get into crime. He was very much... I think he was actually a, 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 a Cambridge... Oxford or Cambridge. Oxford or Cambridge, yeah, yeah. A graduate. He yeah. rocket science or something fucking bizarre like that. There was nothing criminal about what he thought he was doing at all. He was a salesman selling marijuana. And the job was to get it from there to there, and that's it, and he could do it. Yeah. He knew President Marcos, he knew... You know what I mean? Fuck! Right, and that's what he was doing. He was a gangster, he's never owned a gun, he has never hit anyone, he's never been hit. He's not, you know, he's a fucking beautiful, beautiful creature. What about Ronnie Biggs? No yeah, way. well, listen. I was honoured because because I was I was honoured enough to meet um, Bruce Reynolds, the the the, the brain great of train. the great time rugby. He's very talented. Son Nick Reynolds, who's done all the the Constal Icon exhibition, which is most probably iconic in itself, as it would never be allowed to happen again. Um, they invited me out to Ronnie Biggs's seventieth birthday in Brazil on the beach with everyone that was left alive of the great train rugby. When well, I'm telling you. Just. It was nearly a sexual experience. I'm telling you, I was just sitting there with them on that, like, on this beach with Ronnie Biggs and Roy Shaw and Bruce Reynolds and fuck, what the fuck am I I'm in heaven? You know what I mean? So, and he is the although not the brains of the outfit. I don't know anyone that could play the part of the British fugitive on the run better than Ronnie Biggs. How many jobs did you get away with? Oh, I would say uh, a pretty big percentage because, uh, you know, you get caught once and uh, unless you're dumb enough to have cases taken into consideration, uh, you don't get caught for the ones that you did. So, like, I, I might commit, say, say 50 crimes or 50, 50 uh, criminal acts and uh, only get caught for one. The world loved him over there mm. and because of the despicable way they've tried to get him back here and all that, you know, like with the people that have tried to kidnap. grab him and kidnap him and bring him back and the president going, kidnapping is the biggest crime in our country. The English have just kidnapped someone off our beach. What do we do about that? And the, the forces went out and picked him up off the boat and said, come back, you're a hero. Honestly, that's fucking wankable. <laughs> and his son, Michael Biggs, is a very, very good friend of mine. I haven't seen him for a couple of years, but he's a beautiful man. I was in prison with him in Belmarsh, I was in hospital with him in Belmarsh, I've been to his funeral, I've done his funerals, I've done, I've been to, you know, he, 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 I love, I love him, Ronnie Biggs is a, he's a, the perfect man for the job of the typical British English um, fugitive, right, he's perfect, a lovely man, yeah. What about how the system treated him when they brought him back in the end? They tricked him. But it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? That, that tricked him. They cannot let it be seen that crime pays. Right? You've got to keep that in your fucking head, sir, right? Mm. They cannot, because they've got control of the television and all the networks and all that, right? You cannot ever let it be seen that crime pays. Ronnie, Reggie and Charlie all died in prison and, you know, and, 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 and they will make it. And, and, and Ronnie Biggs, they, they tricked him into going, you're that ill, you have to go to London for that. And we will give you a hundred thousand pounds if we're the ones that bring you. If you don't go back to London and get this uh, medical help that you can get there for fuck all, you're going to die, dick brain. Mm. Right? So come back to London and do that. So they brought him back to London, and then they had a court case about letting him out of the hospital while he was like that. Uh, 
whether he was going to stay in prison or the hospital. And they adjourned that court case on purpose, and then adjourned the next court case on purpose, then adjourned it again on, on purpose, and then before they actually gave him the underground for coming back, they went, your legal bill is under and... And you have to pay it. So he came back for fuck all. They tricked him, right? And treat him like a fucking dog in prison. I'm t I was in the prison. I'm not saying it to be anti prison there. I'm just saying like a fucking dog. Right? And made sure that and Ronnie died. Now I'd done a, a great big event for him. I'd done a massive event with a man called um Adrian Doughty, uh for um Ronnie Biggs and for, for Roy Shaw, I've done one for Joe Parr, I've done all them events, and they just wouldn't allow it to be actually made public. Mm. They wouldn't allow anyone to go, they weren't allowed to advertise it in the paper, they weren't allowed to chat. You know, they'd done a bomb scare on the night and shit. Oh, you know, they'd done all that on Ronnie Biggs, and on the night of his thing, they wouldn't let him, and he was in a hospice, and we were taking him out of the hospice to go to his thing. They wouldn't let him leave the hospice, handcuffed up. Terrible. Like, fucking. So, you know, so what's your well, advice? Never trust the system then. Do you need to be told that, really? I've got to be honest. I've got to be honest. I'm only this clever because I'm this old. And, and there, was a, there was a time when I weren't as clever as this, maybe a 30 in that. But don't trust the system. All you believe is what's on that big screen, like they're going to say to you next week. There's a spike in some place. You don't know. They're just telling you there's a spike. Who the fuck are they that's going to go and practice what they're doing I'll try it with Oldham. Oh, that's all right. We've done that. Now we're shut off Leicester. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. All right, Leicester's done. Right, we'll try that. Now we'll try another. We'll do a big one on you. We'll try Leeds. Right, we've learned all that. And that's what they're fucking doing. Right, at the same time as we was all told no one's allowed to leave their front room, the council started that day shutting down 800 fucking roads around the country, making them a dead end. It, all night they were doing it. Go and check up on your fucking goggle thing. Go and look at that. Yeah? Go all night they were blocking off all the roads. Google. I've just got towed. Check on your Google. Right? I'm a bit of a wanker. Sorry. Check on your Google. Right? They shut off 800 roads and made them all one way for COVID. What the fuck are you doing? Now you're not allowed to leave your fucking home and go to the fucking shop because they said it's after 10 o'clock and, and you'll get arrested and go to the police station. for Really? What the fuck? Because of a, because of a cold? Really? Fucking hell, you'll have me veering right off one of them. Stop it. Good, Go. good. I'm glad I feel the same. But um, off camera, you mentioned Freddie Foreman. Who is Freddie Foreman? Who tell, is the audience, Freddie Foreman? tell the audience. Tell the audience. Freddie Foreman. Obviously, I know personally, but right, please no. tell the audience. He, share a little what, bit about what, him. What, what um, Joe Parr was to me, yeah? Because he was my man, and I, I, I knew the people, you know. Freddie Foreman was to him. And to me. So once you see him treating him like that, you have to treat him like that, don't you? And he treats him like that. So that's almost royalty. That is the last one I left alive in the mon he's the monarch of the underworld. Okay. Okay? The monarch of the underworld. You lick the back of his head to send a stamp. Alright, uh, thirty four one, that's you know, not now. You know, he's eighty eight, but like if you want to sell all that credit where credit's due, fuck me, that one's due all of it. Everyone knows it, like I owe it to the craze for this and all that, yeah? They owe it to him. Yeah, awesome. Joey owe it to him. I, he's the one, and he's still alive. You can still go and touch him. He's still there. That is a real fucking, um, like a Julius Caesar or a, an Al Capone or a fucking... Of course, and you still speak to Fred? Yeah, still touch yeah, him, yeah. Yeah, cool. listen, I'm a grown man. I still go out there purely just to touch him, mate. I was, nice. at, his, I was at his uh, birthday, his 80-year-old, I'd birthday but you know I'm, I'm i still he humbles me not many people do that to me i'm a flash little maybe two from my own two like that no i'm good right but he humbles me and i like that feeling so don't get it anywhere else you know what i mean so he humbles me he's and has been in the day of the gangster a fucking gangster mate of course and so if people wonder if fred's still in good health is he He's, he's been better, but he's actually still alive. He's kicking. He's as good as he could possibly be at eight years old, yeah? In our last interview, Dave, we had Joey Parr Jr. on talking a lot about the Roy Shaw Lenny McLean fights. I know you knew both of them, so you tell us a little bit about both of them. Who do you think was the better one, the two or the tougher one, or who's a bit about their characters? 
Um, I'm glad you spoke to Joe Paul Jr. before me because he's, he's, he's a very important person too. Hello, Joey, and all that, yeah. But um, to be perfectly honest about that, at the end of their careers, Lenny was obviously the far superior. Mm. Yeah, his size, his aggression, his all, all of it, he was far superior. But at the beginning, yeah, you know, when they were both a lot, lot younger, um, and I've seen a lot of battles, but that was much of his evenly match with a big geezer and a little bit as you could as you can get as you can get to see. Yeah, Lenny was aggressive. Roy Shaw was um, like one of them dogs, like some dogs you can pick up a newspaper. You don't have to eat it, and you go. Mm -hmm. And other dogs you can kick him out of the bollocks all day, and it goes <laughs> hanging off a tire. You know what I mean? It was one of them you could eat it and eat it and eat it, and it wouldn't hurt him. You know, so. It made beautifully, um, beautiful spectacles of fights, you know what I mean? But I'm afraid I'm going to have to sit on the fence there. I don't normally do that and say at the end it was Lenny, but at the beginning it was a 50-50 shot, you know, both very tasty bastards and they could both much really beat me up now even though they're dead. Right. So final question, which is one from um, our audience members, if possible, again, connected with Lemon, yeah. Lenny. They wanted to know who would have won in their heyday of Lenny McLean and Charles Bronson, Charlie Bronson, bare knuckle. I'm afraid Lenny. And I like Charlie Bronson, he's a very good friend of mine. And I don't want to fucking upset him. It's coming out soon, he's coming out yeah. soon, yeah. And I don't want to say fuck all. Uh, but I'm afraid in, in, he'd have to admit, in their A days, yeah, Lenny, Lenny, Lenny was a tool, yeah, that was a, a machine. You know, like, yeah. of, there's different styles of fighting. Like football, the long ball game, the dribbling game. There's different styles. There's the ones that, like Nigel Ben, they don't mind getting it as long as they get their one in. There's the Nigel... There's the uh, Eubanks ones that wants to let you, but don't want to get in themselves. There's the Bruce Lees that do the technical stuff. There's the footballer that's going to rip your shirt off and dives into 5,000 people. You know, there's all different types. Well, Len McLean was a, dorm, a, a doorman. He was a do he, he learned his thing in, there was no, you stopped after three minutes and got wiped down. And, uh, he learned to do it in the doorway of nightclubs. He was the best at that I had ever seen. It was fucking prolific. And whatever you thought you were, if you ever see that guy work, you knew you was a dickhead to that. Right? Whoever you were. And I was all right at it. Right? But whoever you were, you saw that do that and, and knew you was a complete cunt to that. Because that was a different era of Dorman. Yeah? That was when Dorman, if you lost a fight as a Dorman, the fucking manager sat you and got a better fighter. Right? Nowadays, you've got to give your name and address and phone number and blood group and picture and all that and if you hit anybody back once you get the sack so how the fuck are you supposed to get good at something you're not allowed to do you can't not play football for six months and come back and you're good at it you can't not box for six months how the fuck is a dormant supposed to be a good fighter he's not allowed to do it right how the fuck so Len McLean fought four or five times a night five nights a week for 20 fucking years so by the time you bump into him mate me and you on the way out of a club half pissed we're in trouble yeah, you know what I mean? You look like a ferocious fellow. Fuck, you? man. I've seen him get you enough of that. I don't know what would have happened if the post weren't behind him, right? It's the only time I've ever seen it. I use enough of that. I, I, I live by them, listen. And I'm talking about Lenny. This, let me tell you, is the best invention in the fucking world. It is important as fire, electricity and the wheel. Yeah? That helps you beat people you can't beat. It made me famous. And if you are someone that has to carry a weapon to work with you, like screws, soldiers, policemen, villains, right? You have to choose the weapon that you don't mind doing the fucking bird for. Right? If you want to choose a knife to go out with every day, you've got to risk it in 20 fucking years, every single day. Right? Every fight you have, you risk it in 20 years. That, that, you get 18 months and you win any fucking fight you can. Any fight in the world, all I do is throw one punch that way, and I win it. Yeah, if you go like that, I break your arm. Right, so choose a weapon you don't mind doing the bird for. That is the fucking tool. There's a little advert. Where was we? Fantastic. There's a few fantastic. You can bits forget that. that no, right? a few fantastic bits of advice you've given for the maybe the aspiring <laughs> criminals. No, whatever, whatever. Yeah, go on, go on. But I'd like to. Um, that rounds off really nicely, Dave. I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. You're cool, man. And. Um, just finally, if you'd like to tell the audience members where they can find you on social media, whether you're on 
Facebook or Insta, Twitter. I think I'm name. on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on all, I'm on all them things. Yeah, I'm on all them, and you can also find me at my house. And if they're not stupid, it is 18 Chestnut Place, SE18 in my Norway. All the people can find me, I'll find you. I'll pitch myself on the wall.